Good morning uh, or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. We have listeners from all over the world. That really surprises me, but I think it's wonderful at the same time. This is Sherry Edwards coming to you through Blog Talk Radio. The show is Sound Health Options, and we try to bring you information and ideas in support of self-responsibility and self-health. We have our one of, I can't say our because other people get upset, but one of our most um, enjoyed and talked about and most responded show, um, Jill Matson is going to be with us in just a few minutes. We're going to turn the show around a little bit. Uh, Richard is not here today, and none of us know why. We do know that he had to move, so... I don't know if uh, that's the issue, but we miss him, And but I'm certainly glad that all of you are here. If you'd like to call in and ask Jill a question, you can do that in a couple of ways. We have a chat on WebEx that you can get a, a link to, and that's on our site, soundhealthoptions.com. And you go to radio on the first page, go to blog talk radio, and there is a link, and you'll be able to watch the show. Someone has their microphone open. I need to close them. Thank you for closing your own microphone. We get a feedback, even though you can... Um, ask a question and open your mic, we prefer that you go down to the bottom of the listing where all the participants are and raise your hand and then we can call on you when we have um, fitted in to the show. You could probably also go to WebEx. Well, we are at WebEx. You could probably go to Blog Talk Studio, although I'm having to watch both of them today. It's a little harder for me. So if you want to uh, call in and listen to us on Blog Talk, usually the vocals are better, 347-850-1407. And I'm having to watch four or five different things here. Um, And I'm not used to doing this by myself, um, but I'll try to muddle through. Okay, Uh, simultaneously broadcasting, I told you about that. Uh, We are sponsored by the Institute of Bioacoustic Biology and Sound Health, located in Albany, Ohio, really nowhere, Ohio, across the state from Cincinnati. And we have clinical services and classes for people who want to be our guinea pigs. Right now we're doing a project on aspartame, and I was in shock. Well, I guess I wasn't. Uh, I was surprised that there's so many things that aspartame can look like brain tumors, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, mental retardation, birth defects, diabetes, chemical sensitivity, multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue, Alzheimer's, lymphoma, fibromyalgia, arthritis, attention deficit disorder. There's just a few that aspartame makes worse. I am We are looking forward to finding a way to counter that for people. We also have a couple of special classes coming up. The one on Tuesday evening that we call Happy Hour, and you can go to our classes and look at that. It's going to be about the new frequencies for bird flu. And we don't have the right things up on the site, but I will get them up there. And we're going to release uh, the information about the new H7N9 that they're threatening us with. And we'll also tell you 
what they're targeting. These look like, very much look like, man-made viruses, and each set of them target a different part of us, whether it's genetics or fertility or whatever. And you'll be surprised and I think relieved when you find out what the next one is targeting because we have some antidotes for you. On our next classes, that's also one here, we have a two-day technician's class and a five-day professional class. I usually don't bring those up on the radio show, but the only time I'm doing it now is because we think we have enough matching scholarships for everybody in the next uh, November class. People have been donating money. It's the end of the year. Um, corporations donating money. They think we're doing a great job, and we try to keep class to 10. So we think we have enough matching scholarships for everyone. So if you are interested, please let us know. Call the office, 740-698. 9119, or just go to our site, soundhealthoptions.com, and go to our classes link. One more announcement, and then we'll bring Jill on. I'm excited. Uh, she's working on her new book. I love her new book. I got a sneak preview of it. Uh, I don't know where this girl gets all this energy, but we'll talk about her just as soon as I look at the keynote. And the keynote doesn't have a lot of information on it this time. I guess that's okay. Things are slowing down a bit. And we've all also always leave you a little um, optical illusion there. For the keynote, most of you know that there's interstellar frequencies coming to the Earth that controls the tides and moon spots and whatever else is going on. And that it does it through controlling uh, or influencing the water. So the water in our bodies, you know, anywhere from 90 to 99 percent, depending on who you read. So these interstellar frequencies coming at us, that's being monitored by NASA and some of the private companies, have an influence on us. So today is probably, uh, right now, for the last few days of F sharp, we're moving in to G, and G is represented by Scorpio astrologically and by blue-green as a color. And I'll just read this to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. For those of you with blood sugar issues, the color of Scorpio, blue-green, is especially supportive, especially when mixed with hot pink. You know, sometimes we can almost see what is influencing people by way of their physiology by watching the colors that they wear all the time. That'd be great if everybody wore the color that they loved for the day. Did you ever take notice of what color you want to look at today? Use the color card, card chart we provided with our Nano Voice personality software so that you can double check your, moon, your mood for today. And we put it there under downloads and also put you a link there. But if you'll remember, it's that note correlate chart that gives you the note, the color, and I'm showing this to our people on the WebEx uh, broadcast. But if you are on the Blog Talk broadcast and you want to have one of those, the link is on our site, soundhealthoptions.com, and the link is under Nano Voice, under Downloads. There's a lot of stuff under uh, Downloads. There's insulin resistance, free software for you there. Uh, radiation exposure is there. Some videos, some other um, goodies there that we try to provide to the public. For this week, it's mostly body parts that uh, is in stress. Nose, ears, and throat. Now, a lot of people have come to the office for throat and uh, swollen glands, we know why. They're sensitive to these influences coming from the earth. I think I'm going to ask Jill about those, too, if she knows more about them. She probably wrote music about them. She's so prolific. 
but they're controlled by the vertebrae C4 and C5, that's the, in your neck. They can manifest negatively as earache or increased sensitivity to noise. Don't overwork your throat without some special pampering, especially if you are involved in a haunted house theater or plan to visit one. We did, did have somebody that came in with a throat issue from <laughs> jumping up and screaming at people in this haunted house theater that they have out in the country. Be sure you bring along some lemon and honey drops to keep all the stress associated with the screaming and laughing uh, far away from you. Flu season is upon us. The literature suggests extra zinc and or vitamin C would be a, a prudent step. Airborne, which is comes in a little vial or uh, it's like a nutrient. Um, you can find it at your favorite store, probably uh, even grocery stores are carrying them. It's chock full of vitamin C and touted to be a magnificent anti-brew uh, for the flu. And I love the gummy format, but you'll probably eat too much. If you eat too many of those little gummies, it gives you sort of an acid stomach. And we had one question. Uh, are keynotes, our keynotes, which is what we call it, ask Jill that question? Officially, I think it is because I think we can pay more attention to sounds now where a long time ago we couldn't. We couldn't hear because of all the man-made electricity. So time for our guests. I've tried to hurry through all those announcements. Jill Matson is one of my favorite people on the planet. She is so authentic, and she does a thousand things. She writes music. She writes books. She paints. She does covers of all kinds of art. Um, she gave us a bunch of her paintings one year for our annual conference. And people were fighting over them. They loved them so much. Jill, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sherry. It's so wonderful to be with you and everybody else. And I'm so excited about our topic today. Look, could you Music of the Sphere. Yeah. yeah. Could you elaborate on the, uh, the keynote there, Music of the Sphere? Here? Music of the Sphere. And how that... Well, uh, yeah, go ahead. How that comes to Earth and how it affects us? Sure, sure. Um, when a planet moves in its orbit, it creates a vibration. And um, I don't know, simple only works for me. I always think of a motorboat in a, in a bay or something. And, you know, as it moves, it has the wave behind it. And so it is in uh, the movement of an orbit and also the rotation of a planet. And, um, and of course, as it's coming to us, you know, there's the Doppler effect, so the waves get a little squished together, and when it goes, it has the opposite effect when it goes away. So, waves come to us, um, from our musical, um, planets, and, um, they're not in our hearing range necessarily, um, but they can easily be translated into a language that we can understand. And so many of them are low frequency. And if you were to, in music terms, just raise the octaves or double the frequency, like bum bum, same note, then you can actually listen to the sounds of the planets. And um, what's so exciting about that is that um, there's so much that can be found about it. And we could go back later and talk about how antiquity viewed this. Because that's really fascinating. But right now, so I try to stay on topic, um, I'll just give you a couple of examples of um, scientists who talk about the other spheres. And one would be Kepler. And um, what he did was he measured the angles of planets from the sun when they were in their furthest and closest point. And he found a musical scale, a very consonant scale um, created by um, Horatio. And he offers that as proof of music of the sphere. And then lots of things, like a lot of the ancient people, you know, were very big on sacred geometry, which is pattern, number, shape. It's created by nature, by space, and found on Earth. And one of the big things is phi, which is found in between the Fibonacci numbers, which they always put in music. Put that in my paint, paint your soul CD. But anyway, it's the universe is like prolific 
with this shape, with this sound. And um, so here's an example. There's this uh, man called Richard Merrick, and he has a free book that is tremendous. It's on interference.com, interference.com, and his name is Merrick, M-E-R-R-I-C-K. Anyway, he was able to measure like a semi-major axis through the foci of each planet's orbit, and I know that sounds a little gobbledygooky, but anyway, he, he calculated the ratio, the distance between the planets, and then he averaged them, and he found that the ratio planets was always by. And it's this, this number that's found everywhere in Earth. And so scientists of old, and even today, are beginning to um, kind of look at the big picture. You know, look at the sky, look at Mother Nature, and look at her math, and look at her sound. And ancient people listen to this. And again, I brought that forth in um, my Stardust and Paint Your Soul TV. But they would listen to this to be in harmony with the heavens. And the idea was when you're in harmony with the heavens, that when your astrology comes in, or the frequencies of the keynote, that you're um, better able to handle the bumps in the road. And um, there's there's some, um, I don't know, is that a, a good enough? I mean, there's so much more. Like I think, in, like in 1776, there was a, a man called Johan Figures, 1776, uh, Titan. And um, he noted that if you put, like, um, Mars as the center of our universe, which is not, but if you did, every planet had a musical octave ratio. So every planet then was an octave, with the exception of the asteroid belt. And he was assuming that there was a planet there that blew up. And I think some people have posthumously called it Maldek or something like that. Um, it's called Bode's Law. So you, you look in the heaven, and not only... Um, are there stars? Maybe we can't hear them, but um, they're all, it's a big orchestra, and there are um, um, harmonies and disharmonies that affect us. And I know I'm just kind of rambling on, but I just thought of another cool thought. The work of Barbara Hero, and I think her website is called lamdoma.com. And one of the things she did was she would find the pitch of an orbit, which you can do. It's just little physics and pretend it's a ball in motion and circle. And she went to different star systems, uh, or different stars, like Sirius or Taurus or Pleiades. And she found that the stars, in which many people channel beings from, that are helping us, all have a um, harmony, harmonious relationship musically with the Earth. So it's kind of like the, the stars out there that we harmonize with are helping us. Jill, I have a question. Just a couple little tidbits. Uh -huh. What planet do we mostly emulate when we're using all of these different scales and things on our planet? Are we picking up those musical scales from other planets or just do we just use something that comes with Earth? Well, our musical scale, everybody thinks that it is the scale, and they, they don't even question that. But our musical scale, we've been using since about hmm, maybe the 1940s, 50s, um, officially. Like, it's it's now like an, uh, an Earth-accepted scale. It's very unnatural. We, we never used this for thousands and thousands of years. We always to the heavens. And during the time of the, the Renaissance, um, music has always been controlled to um, modify people's behavior. Up until the Renaissance, that's when everything was lost. See, the Catholic Church carried on the tradition from all antiquity of controlling music. And when Martin Luther kind of like kicked the, the Catholic Church's butt in Germany, then the musicians were free from anybody controlling them, uh, from what I can see, first time in Earth history. And they started to um, play um, by and all these different um, ancient tones, and then shortly the music got out of the control even of the musicians and got into the control of the listeners. 
So for the first time ever, you could go to a concert. For the first time ever, a musician could make a living playing music that people like. Prior to that, in the Middle Ages, it was a king or a church that hired them. So when this happened, and people, you know, they had a high voice, low voice. And music always had to be modified. So they came up with this equal temperament scale, which blows out all the sacred geometry. It's very unnatural. It's like a GMO. So the music that we listen to is um, it's unnatural. And notice, notice that when this, this equal temperament scale comes into being, the Industrial Revolution followed. In other words, prior to that, we were tuned to Mother Earth, and we were unable to plunder her. But as soon as we stop harmonizing to her, we don't even know where we're plundering her. We just do it. About, and does that help? It does. We have about six questions came in around the same thing. Okay. I love this idea of today's scale that we use. is like a GMO. It's totally distorted. But people want to know about how the church and the government used uh, music to modify behavior because some are more fearful that's going to be well, um, it's been done, from what I can tell, to the earliest days of time. The Zoroastrians did it, the Babylonians did it, and some of these civilizations, I don't know, there's a lot of questions about the accuracy of their history. Many dating them to about 7,000 years before Christ, or after, you know, after the, um, the fall of the last ice age. They all do it. But they're doing it to keep their people in harmony strong, healthy, and um, kind of cohesive. And so, like, for example, in China, they would control the tuning so that every sound, every every community had music that was very harmonious and the A in one was the exact same as the A musical note in another, so that everybody was in harmony. They feel that the, it felt that the, the community tuned to a B flat and an A, that these two communities would be as dissonant in their personalities as those two notes are to listen to. And it's the same thing with musical astrology. Um, when sounds come in that are dissonant, that's when you have problems. And we could go into that later. But the ways that they controlled them was that um, in ancient times, you know, tuning to the stars, the starters, which I did in my startup CD, and um, they were tuning to um, Dibinashi and Solfeggio, and they were also relocating the spy, the sound um, from nature, um, at different places in the scale. And let me see if I can explain this. Kind of, um, see if I can be clear. If I'm trying to make it easy, okay. So let's pretend we have an actor sketch, and you know, remember that little toy, the right little knobby, kind of made it. A, a, a curve in your drawing, and the left little knobby made a straight line. Well, sounds change in a range matter. So whenever you play phi, you get a curve. Whenever you play like the solfeggio, which scale, which is phi less, you get a straight line. So I imagine like if you get inside a C now, and there's two tones, a male and a female, okay? They combine, and they keep going up straight until the, the notes combine, and there's a, a, a number that never concludes, an, an unending number, like, you know, 1.1618, da 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 Mother Nature never rounds in her math. So that's when you have a branch going off to the right. And to, to make that more clear, the, brand, the phi is a little bit under phi. And then, you, then you, the plant keeps growing straight. This, we're up to stem now until we get another combination where there's an unending number and it's a little bit above phi. And that makes the next branch go off to the left. And so in that you can see how phi was used to create change. And the ancient Greeks even took it further and now, this is me speaking, just trying to understand their stuff, which is kind of hard. I kind of think of, like, your head is a drum, and you have a different emotions stored in different places in your, in your brain. 
So wherever Phi is in that musical scale, whatever you listen to, it's going to bounce off your drum in a different meaning, or bounce off your skull in a different place, and it's going to hit a different emotion. And that's what the Greek scales were. They were rearranging Phi in the scale to create a different um, vibrational pattern, a different climatic pattern. Um, think of Mazur and Moda's work, a different picture from the sound. And they were rearranging it to harmonize and modify um, troublesome personalities and feelings. And that's a, that's a way of controlling the people. They they were always doing this for good because they're controlling their own. So then they would they would control what children heard. And, you know, they could only hear certain harmony. They weren't allowed to listen to fast music. And they would define that carefully. And what happened in the Middle Ages was that the Catholic Church um, is in competition with the Sumerians, which is, people aren't aware of that with the Zoroastrians and the Sumerians, but that's older and really powerful stuff. So that was still uh, in a shadow of um, ancient power. You had Egypt, which was um, a big competition, and, of course, the Greeks. And what they all had in common is this, this musical astrology and this um, using the patterns of nature and sound to tune to heaven and earth for enlightenment, for growth, for um, values in the personality. And the Catholic Church just wiped it out. They made Phi, listening to the sound of Phi, or, you know, when Phi is found a million times, not a million, but close to it, in, in different patterns of five point of stars. So they also got rid of all the sacred geometry stuff, except, of course, what they used. But, um, so they, they outlawed Phi, and it was called Devils, Diabolus, um, meaning the sound of the devil. And it was not heard, and they came up with the Solfeggio scale, which is phi list, and the phi was not heard until, you know, thought and the Renaissance people, after Martin Luther freed them from the reins of the church. Now, could this be done in a negative way today? Well, of course. Um, sound is neither positive nor negative. And maybe think of sound as God in a way, and it's no respecter of person. It is what it is. And um, to reading antiquity, they always talk about we live in a world of duality, so that every frequency is like has a positive and negative pole. It's like a battery. And because of this, um, you know, each, you know, music can be used to blast. But music can be used to kill, to change your brain waves in a negative way, to make you ill, um, all those things. So, so so it cuts both ways. Now, did I answer your question? Yes, and we're looking at your music. You can tell when we go to a different page on Jill's site, Jill's Wings of Light dot com. You can tell when we go to a different page because this wonderful music pops on that I don't want to drown Jill out so I'll turn it off. But when I go look at her site and see what's new, and I see a lot of new things here, um, you'll hear that little bit of music coming. But next question, and this is from our audience group. Great people listen, listen to what I can do on the show. If people can manipulate people with sound, do you have any of it on your CDs? And could we listen to some of the music from the stars that you were talking about? Or is it just in your CD? Um, no, there are, if you go to com, you can first of all sign up for the free sound healing newsletter, and that gives you three, like uh, 30 minutes of free music, one of which has the sounds of the stars, the actual frequencies in their orbit. And then the other thing I did, because there's always frequencies and sub frequencies, is I put in the frequencies of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen deemed that that would be the vibrations of the elements of the stars, and what a surprise, also the elements within our body. And then I, um, sorry, I got onto the work of, um, oh, Toss Currents, um, Robert Becker, 
Mm-hmm. And he was saying that the the most impactful frequencies on our consciousness would be little tiny ones, like geomagnetic ones, just the little ones, because they're more likely to go in a cell-by-cell transfer in the body. And so for that reason, rather than just bang out the star sounds, which um, are now lost from our music, um, I put them in a little tiny tuning fork. Um, um, so it's so, and then I, then I, I, I composed the music, which is very, um, I don't know, it's very pretty, angelic kind of sounding. And one thing that's kind of fun, um, I did get somebody right in who had a near death experience. And in the Pete Your Soul, um, CD, she said she had heard music like that in her near death experience. I mean, it's really good, I suppose. <laughs> Um, and so, yes, and by the way, I am doing a sale just this week um, for, uh, for almost two for one. It's thought us and think of soul. And if you'd like, Sherry, you asked me um, a really cool question on an email, and I know it's a little bit off, but it also kind of in an odd way ties back, ties back to this kind of music, that tuning to um, Phi and the Solfeggio and um, to the Nashi numbers and the sounds of the stars, how that raises your consciousness. Anyway, um, the question you asked me was a prophetic one. You said, in all of my research, have I learned of a time when um, there was no illness? And I had to think for a while because, you know, I always search for music and haven't searched for that. But... Um, I I did um, I did get an answer from antiquity, and then I also got an answer from channeling. And I don't know if everybody buys channeling, but I always like to keep an open mind for that because it expands my thinking. And this is what I got. What I got was that um, the beings that Earth have experienced seven golden ages, and a golden age would be a platonic year. For 144,000 years, um, you know, like um, if now we're going into a golden age, and that 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 when when we go through this large period of time, which by the way calculates to the musical note of an F, um, uh, we kind of learn different lessons. And they talk about that when we're in this, meaning that our solar system now is in a certain point in the orbit that we receive more energy, and we're coming into that in the next thousand years. Um, so we receive more energy during these periods, and it said that, or what I received was that, in the past, during these golden years, we always had great beings. This would be the time of, um, you know, masters would walk amongst us, many, many uh, ascended beings and angels and stuff like that. Um, but that after we um, position in the platonic the solar system kind of got out of that, I don't know, shower of good energy that we always tended to get into control and negativity and, you know, we always fell apart. And then I was told that about the third or fourth golden age that we um, started, the earth was um, becoming more inhabitable for a physical body. We started becoming heavier in frequency and being more of a physical body. And that we, um, as a, a civilization, as a planet, chose duality, which is experiencing positive and negative poles. At first, it was not good and evil. It was just like a battery, positive and negative. But as we kind of like got more and more physical, we then um, got um, positive and negative associated with right and wrong, good and evil. And when we did that, as we spent time in the evil, because because of the duality, there's both frequencies there, and, and you can't avoid them. So when you spend time in the negative, that's dis-ease or disharmony, and um, that would would make us sick. And that's of course answering your question. So what they what I got my channeling was is that when we chose, when we kind of became a the dimension, a planet, a duality, we then introduce disease um, because it is this, this ultimately a result, somewhere along the line of negativity or disharmony. 
And um, then what I was shown in my little channeling was that um, at this point in time, when we were immersing into duality, that our higher selves or um, our connection to the divine was um, somewhat temporarily severed. And, and, the, and then there was like kind of like an energy that was like an intermediary and in Christianity, that, that intermediary energy would be called the Holy Spirit. And it has different names in different religion, but it's like it's like God that all it is. Whenever you get outside of yourself and just observe yourself, or or the near death experience where you're one with everything and everything's okay, it's it's um it's not an emotionally charged space, and that would be like the spirit. And your spirit, which is way up your life stream, which is connected to the divine, you know, doesn't understand jealousy. You know, it doesn't it doesn't get a lot of things. Like if your child's gonna die it would know that life is eternal and it wouldn't understand that that would make you very sad. It wouldn't understand sad either. And so that was the necessary um, reason to have this Holy Spirit, this intermediary that kind of had like a foot, a foot in divine and a foot in our life. But if we get negative enough, we even disconnect from the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus was doing, was trying to um, connect us, uh, uh, give us um, contact back again with that Holy Spirit. And what, when I channel, what they, because my music is given to me, it's kind of cosmic plagiarism, but, you know, I hear stuff and I write it. So, uh, um, anyway, what they said is that the painful soul, which is the Fibonacci, who means the nature, and the five, um, brings down energy from your Holy Spirit, and that the stardust, and again, this is all just channeling, but that the stardust are the sounds of the planet, Brings down um, energy from your consciousness. So that answers some. Well, I don't questions. know. That answers some questions. Uh, I'll try to combine a couple, but one that I wasn't going to ask yet, but I'm going to since you brought it up. I want to be more creative. Which one of your CDs should I get? Um, I would do the one with five for changes. The page is old. Okay, mm-hmm. and I'm going to combine two questions here. Is there one type of music that is more healing, and is there music that we should stay away from? Okay. Uh, It's almost like you need two answers. There's a generic answer, and there's an individual answer. Um, The generic answer is that disharmonious music, um, and again, music that the frequencies that are... um, High in volume would be another difficult um, type of energy on your body. Think of this. You know, what, what, what is the human body, you know, when, even with the apes and stuff? You know, you look at our evolution, and it's over long periods, hundreds of thousands of years. And we were affected by and modifying our body to what? The frequencies of the time. So that's what? The stars and nature. So we've been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years, and back to the last hundred or so, we get into the to the loud noise and to the dissonant music. Our bodies have not evolved to handle that. So that's going to cause us negativity. And if you look at the work of Robert Sucker, he's showing where the, the, the strong frequencies, even out of our hearing range, cause um, terrible diseases. Um, so. Um, Oh, yeah, and I'm just thinking of another thing. Remember in the rock concert, they would put, like, raw eggs on some of their speakers. And this is the volume, primarily, I think we're talking about here. And they'd fry an egg. Well, what do you think that's doing to your body? So, and and, and if you look at this from a good and bad point of view, you can say that the more dissonant, the more loud, the more harder to hear, the further you get away from God. But. If you go out, like, from the vantage point of your spirit, where, there, where there's no such thing as negative or positive, then you might look at that same situation even differently. For me, when I try to go there and just look at the, our negative music, if you would, it, it makes us feel separate and alone, um, which then, to me, forces us to be accountable for ourselves, whereas if we... We're all one, you know, it's always somebody else can take responsibility and make the decision. But if you're on your own, it's eventually, 
got to stand up on your own two feet. And I, I, this is just me here. I believe that standing up on our own two feet, taking responsibility for ourselves, um, helps us grow in a way that maybe it's worth these thousands of years of incarnating as a human on Earth because this enables us to be like the children of God growing up. How else are we going to learn to be strong within ourselves? And then, you know, then we can advance in our evolution. So I'm thinking that, like the story of the Pied Piper, where, you know, there's all these children, which would mean the children of Earth, and the music is played, and, and she goes throughout time, music's always taking us further away from all that is in God. It's always giving us one more disconnect after and of us when you look in history. And I I'm believe that in that process, um, we do get other skills. And now that we're um, ready to make the turn, many of us, and start back to source or whatever you want to call it, and we're, we're going into this energy period where we get energy from central sun or something, um, that we can go back quickly. And, and I would say from all of antiquity, the quick way is the musical way. It, it, it's kind of an oxymoron. When you listen to music, you ingest it little by little, so you have to listen to it a lot. But the, but the thing is that you're always listening. Even if you're sleeping, you're intaking. You're, you're always ingesting sound. Um, mm-hmm. So it has a, a strong cumulative effect. So, so did I answer that question? Well, they, there's a clarification that came. That I want to clarify what I've asked. I was really talking about good or bad music. Like, should I stay away from heavy metal? Or should I just listen? I think what I hear Jill saying is I should just listen to what pleases my body. But I also wanted to know, is there some way that we could... If we could use some early warning system, if the government ever did come out and say, you only get to listen to this music, what should, is there a type we should stay away from? How can we protect ourselves? Yeah, anything that's dissonant, heavy metal, um, rap is a one beat, you know, it's a one rhythm beat, it's a one pitch beat. Um, what you want in music is, is a range of tones, you want it to be harmonious. New Age music is great because it's bringing back the old technique. Uh, and, of course, you know, hopefully it will be a better kind after that, too. About but, math and music? Okay. Well, yes. they're the same thing. Yes. Yes. And so what would the question be? The question was, listen to the music that has uh, harmonic math as music. We're being yes. Asked, we're being asked here yes. too. People um, want more information about uh, your new book. When is it coming out? What ways of time? Uh, the spring. The spring. I'm so excited about it. Um, it is awesome. And you know, another thing that I forgot to bring up was um, when we talked about um, music of the spheres was that um, how the Egyptians did it. And I think they're going to like this. In Egypt, they believed that every person had what they called a chi body, a chi, something like that. It's like an spherical bubble. And that every, every again, we're in duality. So you're trying to manage um, balancing frequency all the time. You're always balancing reciprocal. Like, you're always balancing, another way to say, uh, complementary colors. And I know you preach this all the time about the importance of reciprocals and um, how, how, how you can balance the frequency by that. But so they had in their thought pattern in Egypt, you had this double body called a chi. So like if you were male, your chi would be female. You know, if you were red, your chi would be green. And they would often do healing on the chi body to tune it up. So they were tuning for duality, like both parts of the pattern. And um, so I did that with the solfeggio tones. I, I redid my paint your soul because there's 18 of those frequencies. There's like a pattern and then there's like a mirror pattern. And it was kind of interesting because um, my I have a friend who does cranial sacral. So we're always doing it on each other. And we were able to clear 
many things by um, just simply asking to be shown the energy of like a, of, of like a high body or a spirit double. And it was, it was very powerful to be cognizant of, you know, you need a set of frequencies that are reciprocal of everything you are for enlightenment. Was, I don't know, I just thought the Egyptian idea was kind of cool. What do you think? I think it's wonderful. It's, it's like healing the etheric body first, and then the rest of it just kind of clears up. Yeah, I thought so too. And another thing that the Egyptians did when it came to music of the spheres, they would use the music of the spheres to help the pharaoh, in their belief, cross into the next world. And some stuff says that they would use a, a, a rhythm pattern in the three, one, two, three, one, two, three, kind of a rhythm timing, and that they would make the sound of the um, planets. Um, and it, all throughout antiquity, they related um, vowel sounds to harmonic patterns, and that has been proven so with modern, modern science with Clarence Bill Miller, who photographed vowels, and they do indeed have different harmonic patterns. And um, so um, they they would. Um, where am I going on this? Um, oh yeah, Tony. So and so, um, I was just looking flipping through some papers to find the vowels, what they considered the seven planets. I'm going to just tell them to you. But um, so they would tone then these vowel sounds, which would represent different types of harmonic patterns, or maybe harmonic patterns on different key notes. And then it was like a matrix, so like a Rubik cube. And once they got all the different vowel sounds together that represented the planet, they were kind of like infusing their body in a healthy harmonic matrix of tones. And you understand that, Sherry. Did, did you have anything to add to that? Or? I think what it really says is that everyone has their own harmonic uh, set of music in it. That may lead us over here to this is maybe why you don't get along with that person or you get along very well with this person that they match they match your your notes because we all know that DNA um, actually has concrete pieces to it that give off vibrations of sound and together make it kind of a haunting music. So yeah, I have, there's a question yeah. and. It probably is just over my head because I don't understand the question. You probably will. Is there a tool um, yeah. like Nano Voice which would illustrate the spectra of music? They're talking about Nano Voice, um, our little teeny program that uh, people speak into and they can tell what notes are prominent and what notes are missing. Um, but okay, could you, um, I'm not sure I quite understand the question again. Could you say it again? Is there a tool like Nano Voice which would illustrate the spectra of music? I didn't understand. Okay, the illustrate the spectra of music. Well, it's kind of hard because it's like you can look at music from a harmonic viewpoint, which is harmonics are just like after ripples. It's just following matrix patterns of how things. Um, vibrate. They vibrate always the same. And you could look at terms and pitches, which affects us. You could look at things in terms of rhythm, which affects us. You can look at terms of, again, instruments, which are, again, harmonic patterns. And so um, it's, it's kind of hard because all of those all of those factors can be considered spectra of music. Um, my book is showing you Spectra of pictures throughout time, pitches throughout time, and a little bit of the harmonic pattern. And um, a lot of that ancient, I can't wait to to see the real thing. But you know, you have let me read it. I was so pleased. You let me read it before him, but it always comes out more blossomed, more full um, when it comes out. Actually, you have a couple of other books if people want more information. Ancient Sounds, Modern Healing, and Secret Sounds, Ultimate Healing. They're on your book, on your site. We're looking at them. Those are looked at some of, of your CDs. Uh, people are asking two questions. Oh, they're back to, we want to know if the government is controlling us now. 
with sound and music. And people want to hear the music of the spheres and want to know if you have any. We don't have a whole bunch of time. I was trying to put all the questions together. Okay. In the music of the spheres, that is the energy in the stardust TV. It is the actual energy of the elements and the pictures that the planets in our solar system give off. Um, and um, is the government controlling that? I don't have any proof of that now. I would suspect that they're out there making man-made, I'm suspect, I, this is not fact, uh, that they're, they're making man-made viruses. I would imagine that there's sounds out there that do the exact same thing. I mean, gosh darn, it would probably be cheaper to do it that way. I can't imagine that there aren't, but I but I don't have any proof. Um, and w another thing for the sound of this music of the spheres, again, um, those, those two, the stardust and the um, paint your soul are these ancient methods of tuning to heaven and earth. But I, ha I found this sheet of paper as looking for. And in ancient mystery schools, they would have chants that were very, very secret, very hard to find. And you know, whenever I found glimpses of them throughout the globe, they would always be different vowel sounds. And often they would be in a little bit different order, but kind of like a ya kind of a thing. And now I have here from the antiquity the Egyptian vowel sounds, which would be a chant of the music of the spheres. It would be a chant of the harmonics in the heavens. And they, they first, because this is their understanding, which is, different than ours, and science has just proved a little bit, but each planet now, they're, they're thinking um, is in distance from the Earth. So they're, they're saying that the A ah goes with Venus, E is Mercury, I is the Moon, ah, no, excuse me, E is Mars, O, U with Saturn, O with Jupiter, and ah, uh, ah, like for Om, with the Sun. And the order in which the Egyptians uh, chanted this um, was A, E, I, F, U, O, A. And that would be a chant that would um, create harmonic patterns in their body. And they believed, um, talk towards enlightenment, they believed that was music of the spheres. And... Um, I can't imagine it being anything but healthy because it's filling your body full of beautiful harmonic patterns. We, and it's free. I'm reading lots of questions here, and, I, and we only have a few minutes. Um, if you could give us an answer about what work is H-A-A-R-P that the government's doing, that would be great, and how to protect ourselves. And do you do private sessions and give people their private sounds? And where are you going to be appearing? Where can we see you appear in person? Um, so lots of different questions oh. there. Yeah, six minutes. Okay, let me, uh, six minutes. Um, I'm afraid I'm not an expert on heart. How you can protect yourself is easy. I have a picture of this in my ancient town book. Music goes up exponentially. Like when you go up octaves, you're not doubling all the time, but sometimes with the energy of the frequency, it's like it, it gets much more and more powerful. So the stronger you are in listening to the silence, um, listening to these um, planetary and vowel sounds, um, listening to heavenly music, meditating, um, observing good habits, you get stronger in frequency. Not a little, not doubling, a lot. And if you channel on, uh, focus on the good things, the good sound, um, you become exponentially more powerful than the crap that harp sends out. So that would be the best way to protect yourself against harp is listen to good things, you know, um, do, do all the different um, healthy approaches, and, and you'll, just, you'll just step right over that. Um, where I'm going to be appearing in person, um, Buffalo on... Um, Tuesday night at the Buffalo Library, um, New York City at um, ARE in November 1 and 2 that weekend, and two weekends later in Philadelphia at Susan DeVal Seminars and Devil's Church. And I love to come if people invite me, so that's always good. And I have a newsletter 
at jillswingsoflight.com when you sign up for the free MP3s. And um, no, I do not do individual sessions. I do them just with my friends. I put myself so much. Um, it's ridiculous, and I don't want to do it one more way. But I would suggest the bioacoustic um, practitioner for your individual sound. Um, that's so beautiful. You, it's it's beautiful cast. Uh, we're looking at your calendar, and I don't see the ARE thing posted. What day was that again? Um, the weekend of November. November. Okay. Like November first. Okay, I just didn't go for it. So this all, it's not just one month, you can look at any month. I love this new website and what you've done with it. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's much brighter and lighter. Um, it, it's much more you, because you have this, this light um, fairy sort of energy, this little wood fairy kind of thing. Sprite, how's that? Do you have... Okay. Do you have... Um, you had a newsletter, so I let's go to home on the pages. And about this site, audio clip, subscribe to the new free healing MP3 directory. So you've made it really easy for people to do this. And then you have mm -hmm. Jill's blog. And what I was taking a peek at was all of these articles. Because uh, every few weeks or so, I get this wonderful little summary of an article of something about uh, music and I love the things about antiquity and how music from long ago still matches here, even though people are freaked out by the fact that the government at one time controlled the music. That's the way the earth was for thousands of years. It is so new to have um, there be no control on that. You and, you know, whoever told us that music was mere entertainment, man, they were sure doing us a disservice. Well, I love it that we, the people, are, control, are in control of at least the music, even though sometimes I think the media is. But we, the people, get to choose by our buying power of the kind of music mm -hmm. that we like. Do you have any, any of the music of the spheres that, and you were talking about that NASA had recorded. Um, I do. Um, we, I, you know, we've been sending them back and forth. That um, I guess with the Richard not being here somehow or other, we don't have that ready. But you can go on NASA's website, and they will give you clips um, of space sounds and stars. And it's a real hoot. They have some spooky sounds from Saturn. Um, of course, a planet associated with challenges, and they have some beautiful sounds. Um, from the different stars, stars out in the sky, and it's it's really quite insightful. And here's another thing that's interesting. This is the work of Jeffrey Thomas Thompson, excuse me. And he has shown that when you take star sounds down several octaves, they begin to sound like whale sounds. You take them down more octaves, he reports that they sound like dolphins. If you take that star sound down two more, it's it's going to be reminiscent of a bird chirp, and two more octaves crickets, and two more octaves humans. That's just incredible, isn't it? It means there's just one great big octave, and they all fall on the scales on them. Yeah, it's like a universe, one voice. We're all singing together. Mm -hmm. We have a lady that yeah. says she's very anxious and wants to know what uh, which of your CDs you would recommend. Uh, if she's anxious, um, pinch your soul or stardust are the most calming. Okay. So when you give a description of these on your site, do you tell people what each of them is for? Well, if you go onto um, the home page or the sales store page, click on the actual picture of the CD. It would bring up a page that describes it in great detail and gives you samples. And testimonies, I think. I love this artwork on Pink Your Soul. We should tell people that Jill does all of this artwork in addition to all of the music, in addition to all of the research, in addition to all of the events. Uh, and you at one time had your own 
radio show or appeared regularly on several shows, didn't you? Um, I'm trying that out a little bit. I think it's this month. I'm just experimenting with it. I think it's the 31st at Blog Talk Radio with Rosalia. Um, just experimenting with that, with my own radio show. Well, we're certainly happy that you had time for us. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. There is so Thank much for information you. coming out of you. It's just like bubbling all over. And uh, I can't wait for your book. You're going to announce it, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And I'm, again, so grateful to be here. Well, we thank everybody for being here. If you love the show and love Jill, please announce it on your Facebook that um, there's information about what to do and with external music and how to create your own internal music through the guidance of a very special person. Thank you, Jill, for being here. We're out of time in there. It's always that way with you. We'll talk to you all later. Okay, blessings, everybody.